absorption band out here, but the plate radiation spectrum is weak there, so the combination of these two gives you a very good selective surface, and you put it in the right sort of polymer or in the right paint binder, which we do know some that do the job, you can get a very nice uh, selective radiator. However, the question is what do you want to do in practice? Now this is a complex graph, so I won't dwell on it, but this is silly, this shows you how cold you can get. This is subambient, so what we're doing is cooling below ambient. <coughs> this is in a, a system that does uh, help reduce convection, and uh, what we see here is the black body. The black body cools best when you're close to ambient, but drops off very quickly because the reason being that it, it's absorbing all that incoming radiation as it cools down and it heats up more rapidly. These guys reflect the incoming radiation. They're not as good to start with. This is silicon uh, dioxide. This is uh, the mixture of the two, and this is silicon carbide. So. The problem with the selective emitters is they have a lower emittance, so near ambient they don't give off as much heat. This, this, these units here are watts per meter squared, so you can get around 100 watts per meter squared from a black body near ambient. Uh, the other, so, but you notice that silicon carbide in principle can get very, very cold if, if you know it, but in reality you can't because, as Bob said, we've got convective heat gains and other things. So it depends what you do to stop this stuff. This is the incoming stuff from all around you, local air and uh, whatever. Conduction, depending on how well you insulate your system and so on. So this is, uh, these are what we call the U value, one or two. This, this is two, this is one. So where, you, where these graphs meet is your lower limits in practice. And in, if you're really clever, you can push down the low one, but in simple systems we work with, they tend to be up around here somewhere, and you means you can get down on a dry night to minus 15, which we've done here, and Angus will show. But uh, there are other practical issues which will, will come up later in the talk. So, this is about a turnover point for me, I've focused on the basics. Um, I'll reserve, we'll wait till the end for other questions because we'll jump into bit more of the technology after this slide and I'll we'll change uh, the tandem into the next part of the tandem act. But um, so what we're about here is minimising solar heat gains because that's the first step. There are lots of things to do that. We want to cool at night. Now the thing I haven't discussed is storing the cold and that involves flow of, it's like in a solar collector you're flowing water through. We can flow water or other heat exchange fluids and store them. We can cool them off to temperatures that are colder than ambient. The other thing you want to do is reduce the heat pumping in the neighbourhood because the air conditioners pump heat from here to there. They don't take it very far. So uh, if we all have an air conditioner in a high-density high environment, uh, we're not helping, at least the neighbourhood. And that heat, a lot of that heat finds its way back into the building via air exchange. So we're focusing on ways of getting the heat out into space, either by solar reflection or by radiation. And there's interesting possibilities in hybrid, but we won't have time to discuss that today. So I'll now hand over to me. That's the building next door. As you can see, it's a terrible building thermally as well as visually. This was um, taken a couple of months ago. It was a 20 degree day. You can see the red colour. The whole building was about 32 degrees. This was about 11 in the morning. Even. So that's not very good. You've got the yellow stripes of the windows, you've got a lot of heat loss through that, so you, that's a problem. You can see what Jeff was talking about, about the sky being quite cold, because that's black. I think they were saying it was about minus 15 degrees in this one. Um, and then you can see the light bluey colour is a cloud coming over him. Because obviously clouds have more water vapour, so they're going to radiate with a higher temperature. Um, the, on the right hand, left-hand side there, it's one of the panels we make. I've made a few different ones by, because we want to have a heat exchanger that we can pump water through, the easiest way to do it is to take a different sort of collector, change the coatings on them and put it into a new system. This one was a um, hot water system collector. <coughs> Obviously we want to be able to radiate through, so we have to remove the glass because that's not transparent thermally, so that's replaced with a different material. 
So we can still block the convection, so we don't have heating from that, but we can still radiate heat out. Um, I've, we've also done, that would be a pretty expensive way to make these things. We've also converted uh, PVC hot water uh, pool heaters. So you can do that and do a similar thing with that and get quite good results with it. This one here is was done with just simple aluminium plate in an insulated box with a polyethylene cover over the top of it to allow you to block convection on it. And you can see that the red one here, the reason it started off warmer than ambient was because I had it inside the building, took it outside and it started there. And very, very quickly it dropped down below ambient. So you can see ambient's around 13 degrees. Within 15 minutes, you were at zero and we, at this point the dew point was about one to two degrees. We'd started creating ice on the surface. This was about was it 4.30 in the afternoon, 5 o'clock? As this was on the Friday afternoon, I was like, well, I would go home, but I want to see how much ice is creating. So I stood around and I saw some bubbles of ice there. Okay, okay. Um, but you can see here, through the daytime, it's not heating up above the ambient at all. All we have to stop the sun on it is a, we just put a deflector on the northern side of it, so we just have it in shade through the day, but you're still getting 150 watts of sunlight onto that, onto a panel if it's in the non-direct sun, but we are still maintaining below ambient. And one of those ones is the blue line is a high emittance material, whereas the red one is one of these selective emitters that Jeff was talking about, which only radiates through the sky window. And so because we're significantly below ambient temperature, those ones are performing better, so we're actually able to get to an even colder temperature than the black body could get to by a couple of degrees. So, I'll mainly talk about high emitting surfaces because it's a lot simpler to go through. Um, so, we do a few things. We make samples, test systems, and also do modelling of it all. Because you want to be able to compare your results and then test whether a new surface you're going to make is going to work well. And you want to be able to compare it in different climates throughout the world. So, the easiest way to do it is you can get data called the IWEC data, which is International Weather for Energy Calculations. And it has some really helpful data in it, including the downwelling infrared radiation from the atmosphere, which includes the, so you'll, that includes the water vapour content, the clouds, and everything. So it makes these calculations a lot simpler for a black body calculation. <coughs> we also need to know what the ambient temperature is and the wind speed, and how much sunlight's coming down, so we can calculate what the surface temperature will be throughout the day and night. This is hourly data for a whole year, so we can see what the heat gains will be and how that will affect the air conditioning load. And so, we, it basically solves the equations for con the external convection, radiation and incoming, using the natural and forced convection. Um, for these ones, because you want to simplify the model for air conditioned buildings, you have it as a, as a 24 hour air conditioned building, which a lot of commercial buildings are, for single storey ones, so you can have a maintained internal temperature. Because you've got a known R value of a building, you can do the temperature gradients across it to work out what your heat flow will be and how your new surface will affect the building loads. <coughs> we have to put one equation in for a bit of fun. If you don't have the IS <laughs> data, you can actually calculate what the down, how much infrared heat is coming down. People have sat down and worked out equations for including the cloud height, the amount of cloud cover, and everything. So, if you're unlucky enough not to be able to get the full data, you can get it from the standard <coughs> Bureau of Meteorology stuff, put it into this, and then calculate what you're looking up to do. This is basically showing you how hot a roof will actually get. I'm just comparing three different sorts of roofs there. Um, one's a standard white roof, like down on the Maritime Museum. That one look nice and bright white, but as a solar reflector it's still only 50%. And so most colour bond ones are around that sort of thing. They've got new products out which are 77%, which is great, because that's going to make a big difference, but they're not <coughs> old buildings obviously. Um, Galvanised roofs, after they're a few years old, they'll start off with a higher reflectance and lower emittance, but after about three years they average out to about R half and an in-between emittance. Or you can compare it to a new roof with a new cool roof with a high reflectance of high emittance and see the significant temperature differences. 
So a metal roof, you'll be up at around 68 degrees. In, this is for a summer's day. This is a Sydney summer day. It was like December 1st or something like that. Um, just having a standard white roof because of the higher emittance means you're going to be dropping 10 degrees. But if you have a slightly higher emittance again and a higher reflectance, your roof's only getting 35 degrees. So that the effect of that onto your building's heat load is going to be very significant. That's the daytime. If you're looking at nighttime, you'll see ambient here is about 23 degrees. With the cool roof or the standard roof, because the emittances are similar, they're both below ambient because of this night cooling effect. A galvanised roof doesn't get as low because it can't radiate it out as much heat. These, the limit of this is obviously the natural convection flowing past it and maintaining the temperature. <coughs> so we can split it up into the different parts. You've got the sun heating through the day. The standard roof is going to be a lot higher because it's absorbing a lot more sunlight. So it's 550 versus 150. And then, interestingly, because it's a hotter temperature, obviously it's going to be convecting more heat away and radiating more heat away. So these numbers are higher than they are for a cool roof, but when you sum the two together, the cool roof is absorbing less heat into the building. As you can see up in this top corner here, the cool roof is only gaining 7 watts per square metre heat, as opposed to a standard roof, which is 23 watts per square metre. So it's a 70% less heat going to the building at your peak daytime. In the night, they're fairly equivalent because they've got a similar emittance, but in the morning you'll see there's a difference here because the emittance is higher and the reflectance is higher. The, you'll see that the convection and radiation at night balance each other out pretty well. The slight difference is the difference which is going into the building. And so you do this over the year, you'll get some days that are more cloudy so you won't be getting as much radiation, you'll get more, some days are more windy, you'll get that. So it's important to take typical meteorological data for wherever you're going to be doing it. Because if it's in Darwin, you'll have some time of the year where you'll be able to radiate really well. Other times it's going to be rainy and cloudy, so it's not going to work as well. Whereas if you're in Melbourne, you've got pretty good most of the year because it's, they've got a nice dry atmosphere a lot in summer. So it's, it's quite interesting when you're looking at different scenarios. So how can you utilise this? You really need to be able to separate your nighttime gain, or your nighttime cooling, and your <coughs> daytime heat load. If you just have a roof out there, yes, putting on a solar reflector is great because you're going to be able to have less heat getting into the building. But if you want to have an on-demand cooling for, if you want to cool a room at a particular time of the day, you need to be able to store that cold at night and then cool off the room when you want it. So if you have a pump system where you can have a, a heat exchanger on your roof and pump it through that into a large storage tank. That's great. You can store the cold away from it and then pump it through your system when you want to. And there are systems out there that people have done that show this. They do it and it works and it cuts down their energy significantly. But it's not out there very much yet. Um, so, yeah, if you, as Jeff was saying, if you want to do it with insulation, in the day, high insulation is great. At night time, you're not going to get any cooling effect, and that's a bit of a problem. The other way thing you can do, if you want to just do it simply without having to put anything externally on your building, instead of insulating directly under your roof, insulate it at ceiling level instead, so then that cavity can cool at night. And if you have a fan linking the, that to your building, you can pump your cold air through it at night into the building, cool it off, and during the day you can vent, have a separate fan which is venting that. So you can start to separate the, the two loads. You want to have, obviously, a low thermal mass outside of a building, high thermal mass inside, with insulation in between. A lot of buildings these days are high, high thermal mass everywhere, like UTS, so you have this problem with the heat is maintained all the time. And so we call the cold you're collecting cool. This is um, a pump system we've got set up on the roof with a 3.6 metre radiator that's made from a um, PVC pool solar heater collector. I put a cover over it and put some insulation behind it so it's just a panel I can mount on a wall. 
Oh.